So let's begin. I think we have enough audience, the room full of people, beautiful people. Uh, as a part of Evolve program, uh, we have this speech and we have got Misha today. I would like to welcome you all on behalf of my team, Anastasia, Louisa, Hailey, Anil, Stefan and myself. We have, uh, we have uh, Misha today and I would like to also thank you all for taking the time for being here. And thank you, Misha, for being here and uh, sitting with us today. There is a lot that we miss in our life uh, in this modern generation. And I feel some of the key elements like self-awareness, self-knowledge, and also a deeper connection to our authentic self is missing. And this is why we have Misha tonight, today, and he is going to help us. Uh, he is going to help us bridge the gap. And uh, to you, Misha, like, we would like to start with the name. Why the name Monish Misha? And give us an introduction. First of all, thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. <laughs> thrilled to be here. And we have to admit, we met before and had a little chat, not about this session, but about life in general. And we found that we are very well tuned in on the same frequency, thinking in a same, in a, in a likewise way. Now, when I hear you asking about or saying that we are all missing something. So it's not only me who had that sense or that notion that I'm missing on something that is really dear and important or a part of me. So now I'm calling myself Mönch Micha, which is a word play of the German word Mensch and Mönch. It would be in English, maybe Mank, like man and monk. And uh, I am indeed, I don't look, but I am still a Buddhist monk, but I left the order, I retired from the order after 14 years being a monk, and now I don't have a master or a community to tell me what to do and when to shave my head or what to wear. And I'm enjoying and exploring that new freedom. And my monastic name, funnily, was Brother Freedom. Um, that is answering your question about the mm -hmm. and even more. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, again, I would like to mention he had been in the monastery for the last 14 years and he brings back a lot of wisdom and he has also been involved in training the employees of some big corporations like Meta, Allianz, Google, Salesforce and also some Silicon Valley companies. And I'm very glad to have you. Uh, my next question would be like, tell us uh, how did it start? Why did you choose to be a monk? Oh, <laughs> there's a short version and there's a long version. Why did I choose to become a monk? Huh? I think what what we how you opened how you opened the dialogue was we are missing something. And I remember myself as a child. I think everybody, if you go back as a child, you know, and you have that freedom and you're so connected with yourself, and you like to undress, you undress and run around naked and don't think anything bad about it. And if you want to dance in a department store, you just dance. If you want to cry, you cry. And there comes a time, I don't know, with five, six, seven, when the adults tell you, no, you can't do that, or you're too old for that. And it feels wrong. Something feels wrong. Why can I do it? I, I did it all the time, and it feels so good, and it's me. But you learn not to do certain things that set you free. And, but they never leave you. And I think this is the beginning of it all. So. There is something that you know is you, but you're not allowed to live it. And I'm not just talking about undressing. You know? Many like conventions, cultures, etiquette, or social life and uh, family responsibilities, behavior and manners. and then. So I believe, looking back, that I still always kept that connection, looking for that free little Misha, who I was, because I was longing for it because I found this is my home, you know, my true self. But of course, we want to play the game. And uh, we also know, like in a big community, in a collective, there have to be certain rules to come together and to live together harmoniously. But it never left me. So I've been working, I've been loving, I've been partying, I've been traveling. I did 
everything what everybody does. I was fortunate to have many monastics uh, in my family. On my mother's side, we had a lot of Franciscans in every generation, from monks to priests to archbishop. So this topic of contemplation, spirituality, or something bigger in you uh, was always there, together with this longing, or maybe this longing, they went parallel. So I, I, from time to time, I had that feeling like, I don't want to live here anymore. This goes so wrong. And then and nobody seemed to know to have the answers to my questions. Not the priest. When I went to church as, a, as an eight, nine, ten-year-old, not my teachers in school. Not my parents, honestly. Sorry, Dad. And no of my mentors could tell me, like, I don't know the big questions. Why is it so? Why do I feel like this? How is the mind working? Why am I angry when I hear this? What's the meaning of life? Why are we all here? Why there's war? And, and, and. It was not satisfying. So I figured I can't trust them. But I have to figure it out myself. I tried many ways, many strategies. Like after school, I started with reading a lot. Like the philosophers and the antiques and the contemporary ones. Started trying it in relationships. I started then in the 90s when Rafe came up, we started partying and taking drugs. Nothing was fulfilling. Then I traveled, I traveled to India, I traveled to Jamaica, to Australia to, to, to find and, and stayed there for a long time. To, to It was not until I found out I have to do a journey, but I have to do a journey within. And then this wish came up, I guess, this family genetics to really seclude myself and take care of myself in order to be able to understand my inner world. And only then I could help the people around me, the people I love that I failed so many times because of my untamed emotions, because of my not moderate being, and because of being driven by, by feelings and, and thoughts and no stability and clarity which I was kind of in freedom, which I was longing for. I decided at one point, and it was, it was funnily also, it's often suffering when something cracks open and there is actually no other way than facing yourself when a very loved partner left me. She just left me because I was, I don't know, stupid or bad, and I couldn't cope with it. And this cracked something open in my heart that I said, what are you doing? You want to do this to the rest of your life? Do you really want to understand now or begin to understand why you are making the people you love most suffer? No, not only her, but also my sister, my parents, my friends. I'm not in control of myself. I'm, I'm like a tiger. And I want to tame the tiger. And then I said, it's all in now. It's now or never. And helping with this monastic genetics helped me to say, okay, I want to do it now. By then I was 39, 39 years. Mm -hmm. That's how, and then I met, then I met um, this teacher in the form of a book because when I, after this breaking up of that girlfriend, I was wandering around town just to lose my thinking or to calm down. And I looked into the window of a bookshop where there was this book with a Zen master I didn't know. And he looked at me and I looked at him and we locked eyes and I, had to stare at this book cover and it says times of awareness and then a little voice in my head popped up and said this is what you need right now i said went in bought the book that was the beginning of my <laughs> entrance in the monastery i read more books i went to the retreat center i loved it and a year later i quit my job and i went there and sold everything and ordained crazy huh everybody told me you're running your own bankruptcy you're crazy. And I thought so too at times, but I knew I have to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing all the experiences that you had before going to the monastery. I also picked up one word that you mentioned twice, parting, yeah? You were parting hard. So being a monk now, is it like you, you, you have a wild Friday night or is it just tea and tranquility right now? Uh -huh. But now, now time passed and I'm 54 and I think I partied enough in my life, you know, I, 
I made sure before going to the monastery, I fulfilled my wildest fantasies and dreams in every, <laughs> in every aspect of life. So I didn't miss it in that time, and I don't miss it now. But now I would have the freedom if I want to go party, I go out. Nice. Uh, next question would be like, now that you were already there in monastery, you had the peaceful life, you were more connected to yourself, you had all the wisdom, why? Did you decide to come back and but provoke that thought that you want to share more with the people? Yeah. Seems like at the like at the beginning I was crazy, right? That I'm leaving this world to go into the monastery and then crazy that uh, why would you go back? I was very happy there. I was by then the abbot of our uh, monastery in San Diego, California, which is a beautiful place. Half an hour from the Pacific Ocean, half an hour from San Diego. We lived in the mountains. I was the abbot. I was on the board of the Thich Nhat Hanh Foundation for years. I had a good connection with all the brothers. I had a green target. I could have grown old there, you know. But what is it that brings you out? Like just before, I had everything. I had a good job. I had family. I had friends. I had a social life. I was happy, and even in the but not fulfilled before. I was looking for the real fulfillment to meet my true self. And then I had 14 years where I had at least, you said that we live in harmony. And that's generally true. But wherever you have a bunch of people living together, we know there are up and downs. It's just like, that's what making connections interesting and spicy. That's how we grow and learn from each other. I was going through difficult times, so it was not always nice and dandy. But we had strategies and techniques with mindfulness and meditation to communicate within and without and uh, observe our minds and understand and analyze it and embrace feelings and stuff. That, yes. But it is not all like we often imagine a monastery is like everybody's meditating the whole time. I mean, we work, we drink tea. And we kind of party too, you know, we listen to music and sometimes even somebody dares to dance, you know. It was, there was no logic within it, but again, like a connection I had strengthened uh, with the years to my true self. Additionally, our teacher, my teacher Thich Nhat Han, he passed away two years ago and that started the whole process. I had a dream, and not only me, many of us received some sort of package from him. And I, I think this must be something like when your parents die. My parents are still alive, but that's how I imagine it. Maybe some of you know that. When your parents pass away, that you receive a responsibility, or you're taking something from them, or you become a part, or they become a part of you more than before. And he appeared in a dream to me, giving me a package, like a box, and said, like, this is every, this is for you, this is your box. Here is everything, like, you came with to this place. Here's everything you have learned. Here's everything I want to give you. Now go bring to the world. That's the wall. I mean, that's a clear message, huh? This is nothing like making think, shall I do it or not? You have to do it. But still, it's a big decision. So it took me one and a half years processing. I don't want to regret it. I have everything. I'm happy. I'm living in this community that lives really in, in harmony and to me understands how to relate to others and how to relate to myself. But of course, also being a Vietnamese community, there are a lot of cultural aspects. There are a lot of different personalities, a lot of different ages living together. Two sexes, the nuns downhill, we're uphill in, in different centers, but we work and meditate together and organize. So there is harmony and conflict. So it was, I just didn't want to regret it. I didn't want to do it. Like back then when people said, you're running your own bankruptcy. I knew I want to do it and I have to leave society in order to see myself from a different perspective. And the same here again. I didn't want to do it and then regret it. It was only on a hike when I had that dialogue that inner somebody have inner dialogues, except for me, right? All the time, actually. But there, hiking in the mountains, it becomes very spacious. 
and gentle. And there's actually a space to ask questions. And so I was resting at a, at a rock and then this gentle voice myself came to me and said, you cannot make a decision. I said, I cannot make a decision, you know, but I know what you need to hear. I said, oh, you know what I need to hear. Would you be so kind and tell me that, you know? So I said to myself, you just don't want to regret it. You, you need to know that you won't regret it. I said, exactly. And I felt that relief. I don't want to regret it. And then it said, I can't promise what will happen and where your path will lead you. Nobody knows, but I know that you won't regret it. And that was the day I made the decision. And then I filled in the elders, I filled in the other brothers, and I prepared. And then it took half a, half a year more because I wanted to leave slowly, harmony, that people really understand that there's some inner GPS that is guiding me into another direction than community is going, but I'm still on the same path. Mm -hmm. So it is a mix of inner voice of the teacher passing and like also the wish after so many 14 years to give back to my city. I come from the Rhine Main area. I grew up here to give back to my people where I grew up that nourished me, that fed me and that mentored me to give back what I have learned, like, like a souvenir, bringing back you know, a little treasure, uh, a little gift from, from a long journey. And I'm enjoying it tremendously, like offering Schnupperkurse or free courses in the park and mines or doing workshops and, and just just showing people how easy and light it is to be in touch with yourself and that you don't even have to make space for it or do something really different or set aside, but just doing it from, from that space inside where you create a little bit more space and, and loving from inside out, loving yourself from inside out, radiating and doing and being the person you are. Thank you very much for sharing again. While going through your online portfolio of videos, I discovered something called eating meditation, which I have never heard before. Would you like to give us a trial about that? We all have some fruit here, and we would really like to put it in practice. How do you do it? Right, let's do it. Eating meditation, or in this case, we have a tangerine meditation. It's just like, just an example, applied mindfulness. It's something that you do things mindfully, you do anyway, like walking, like opening doors, like sitting, like breathing, like being on the phone, or like eating. But we want to do it with an awareness. We want to do it from that place, from that place of the present moment, being aware. In German, we have the beautiful word Geistesgegenwart, which you would translate into presence of mind. But Geistesgegenwart, it is so, such a beautiful word, isn't it? And you, the body is still here, but the mind comes into play. So while we're eating, we can be so connected and realize things that we usually won't if we're just trying to fill our empty stomach while we're walking or driving a car, because there are so many things to do. We can even drive a car and eat a tangerine in mindfulness, walk and eat a pretzel in mindfulness. I want, you, I want to uh, inspire you to look at it and just to feel its weight, you know, just feel its weight and look at the color and the dots there. And you see some bellies and some ribs, just become aware of what you hold in your hands. You know, there's this, Green dot, does everybody has a green dot on their tangerine? Why is that? Somebody in quality control puts it on? <laughs> that's where it starts, you know? Oh, that's a little dot with a branch where it was hanging on. And now you can see it hanging on a branch. Well, this is a Neville, actually, right? A little Neville, this is where it came out from. So now we can imagine the branch, we can imagine the tree and all our tangerines hanging at the same tree. Or while we're looking at it, what a little wonder. And now we see maybe the people who 
shook the tree for it to fall off into its basket to bring it to us here today. And then we can see the father of the person that shook the tree and taught the person how to shake a tree to keep them soft or to shake at the right, the right time, not to shake too early. So they're really sweet. We think of the tree, we might think of the earth where the tree is rooted. What does earth need? It needs water. So we think of the rain, the sun, the elements, the minerals. And here we go, just by holding a tangerine in our hands, squeeze it a little bit. Is it hard or soft? You feel the belly. And like sometimes you massage your own hands, see the crevices, the valleys. Now when we look at it like this, looking deeply into the nature of a tangerine, we also see that somehow we are this tangerine too. Or at least we will become that tangerine. Right? But there's nothing not in this tangerine what is not in us. The sun, the rain, minerals, tangerine, father, a mentor, a teacher. So this is just like one step in a big cycle of life that has no beginning and no end. And that makes a tangerine meditation, a real realization of your, let me exaggerate, immortality. You being in the cycle, you being a transforming being just like this. So let's crack it open now. You just crack it open where you think it is the, it is the, the softest. And immediately there's a fragrance coming out. Get it in with your sense, your nose consciousness, fingers. It is so fragrant that it infects you right away with its joy. And if you taste that sourness, huh? Now I can see it even more hanging there. I can see many smiling faces of kids eating a tangerine. I can see myself as a kid eating a tangerine. Peel it all off, smell it. Look at the little wonder inside. Now there is a little skin, a white skin. Be curious, you know, like an explorer opening a tangerine for the first. Actually, maybe some of us are opening a tangerine for the first time today. You're just like opening and putting it in your mouth, but you're, whoa, what is that? What's doing? And now, before you put it in your mouth, or maybe you have already, but don't go slowly. I mean, we have a lot of music. Look at it, look at the shape. Take it again in. Is it wet or dry? Put it in your tongue. There's a tongue consciousness. You know, if you can establish yourself with, your, with the help of your senses, with the help of the processor of your brain and the body, its hormones and the translation system to connect that all and really establish yourself deeply in the present moment, enjoying, sucking on a little widget of, of a tangerine. And I see some of you are chewing already. How was the moment? Remember the moment when the skin exploded and your mouth was filled with the juice? Huh? You don't need to say anything. I see it on your face. Isn't it amazing? Now, all these elements, you know, we said the sun, the earth, the air, rain. Where does rain come from? Does a cloud die? Is a cloud born? Cloud never dies. It comes rain, it comes snow, hail, or air but it can become water too. This water goes into the earth, nourishing this tree, giving us the fruit. Just come into our body, we sweat it out, it goes back, goes back to the ether, and the whole cycle starts again, and we are a part of it. We are a part of it. If you only take one of these elements out of this tangerine, this tangerine cannot be a tangerine. Without water, it would never happen. Without sun, it would never happen. And the same is true with us. We are complete as we are. All the elements are within us. 
And as we see, just by eating a tangerine, we not only can become aware of it, but it's such a juicy, sweet experience to be alive in this very moment when we are aware. You know, Thich Nhat Hanh, my teacher says, you touch one thing deeply and everything is there. Agree? Continue. We can continue eating and this will spin for us. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing again. Uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to really feel the things deeply that are around you all the time. And as you said, like the element of sun, for instance, it is in everything that we do, yeah? The cloth, the cotton that is made out of it is, uh, if there was no sun, there was no cotton. The wood, the, the bottle, water, everything, like everything is just connected and we need to acknowledge it at the deepest possible level just by being present, being observing. The next question is deviating away a little bit, but it is still on the point regarding fulfillment. Like how do you feel more fulfilled? For instance, uh, in a nine to five job where we all do, maybe I'm working on an Excel sheet or a PowerPoint or, or Word document for, for the entire day. How do I feel fulfilled with that? How do I feel like I have been doing a duty or fulfilling an obligation? How, how do I feel the world is connected through me? Yeah. I just wonder, why are you limiting yourself? Why only being fulfilled from nine to five and not 24 seven, 365? I think this is our understanding of mindfulness or deep looking or meditation, that it is a different thing from our lives. That it is separate. But now we saw actually that everything is a part of everything and it cannot be different because if one thing would be lacking. This is because that is this would not be there. So to work with fulfillment from nine to five would be to work in fulfillment from nine to five, right? And I'm big and always telling people mindfulness is not something serious. Mindfulness is discovering yourself, exploring yourself, exploring your mind, your body, your senses, the world around you, to create a space, to get in touch with your heart, with, with life. Mindfulness is having appointment with life, in the here and now, and acting out of that. And this here and now is... This inside, I said, like loving from inside out and the source, basically, and is omnipotent. It is abundant. There is no end to it because it's a part of that cycle. Right? But mindfulness became a word. What do you guys think? I asked uh, Sasha and Elena before, what do you think mindfulness is? Everybody reads or hears or see something, and we all have maybe different definitions of mindfulness. And I thought, this is so terrible. Another word that got sold and corrupt. And the beautiful meaning and the spirit of it, the essence of it got lost. So I said, you have got to come up with a new word that people still understand, but that it describes it better. So listen. Mindfulness. What do you can you connect with what would mindfulness mean? If your mind is fulfilled. Your mind is full, fully filled, but your mind is fulfilled. This gives to me a more accurate definition of how we can approach fulfillment. No? This offers me a way, because mindfulness is a way that I do things, a way I eat, a way I walk, a way I open a door, and then walk unmindfully forward and let it just slam back. Or I realize opening a door is I'm leaving a space where I made an impact, where I was present and I'm entering a new space. And there's so many teachings in there, like all the transitions in our lives, all the changes in our life are basically walking through doors, through a threshold. We can practice like this little thing and you don't have to do you open the door anyway if you want to go to the other room. You just have the awareness that I'm leaving this place 
I am entering this new place. And this gives you presence of mind. This gives you a link to the present moment, to life itself, to that you, you feel and you sense that you are part of that cycle, that ever changing and every moment, every cell, you say 50 million cells every second die and 50 million cells every second are born or manifest. You are never the same person. And if you not only realize that, but celebrate that, no? I mean, we don't have so much time to celebrate 50 million birthdays every second or conduct 50 million funerals huh, for each cell. But to live in that flow, in that river, is fulfillment. And if I may, may add, like in a corporate setting, but also in a family setting, because I said, it's not nine to five, it's 24 seven. In the monastery, we had four elements of living together. And I don't believe they only belong in the monastery. These four elements are practice. And this is sheer, the practice is, let me call them all. It's practice, it's study, it's work, and it's play. Our teacher said they all belong together. Whatever you do, each of the other one, just like with a tangerine, should be present or is present. So what practice means for us was the meditation practice, the mindfulness practice, but what practice for us means here is eating a tangerine in mindfulness, being aware of opening a door, of uh, opening a tap in the restroom and washing my hands. I continued starting washing my hands like in COVID time, just to have more joy and more presence. I'm doing it 20 seconds again. You remember this? And the thumb and doing it all over, rinsing it off. And I'm enjoying it tremendously. You know, it's not just like already looking out of the door and then leaving, it's being there for you. And it's actually seeing yourself. So practice. Study is that you learn and discover something every moment you look deeply at something. Like our mind is a TV channel, is a discovery channel. You don't need TV, you have discovery channel inside of here. You have so many impressions pouring in all the time, every second. Inside and outside, the 50 million cells outside, everything is changing. If you study that and observe it, watch it, that study, and you learn from it, it's experience. You read, you listen to people that inspire you, mentors. That's the study part. The work plan is very clear, the things we have to do, not only nine to five, but also clean our house, drive our car, changing the diapers of our kids if we have some, you know. This is the work, but we can do that also mindfully. We can do that saying, I'm washing these dishes, for example, because I love the warm water and the foam on my hands, and I make it a play. And there we come, we have to make place and space in our lives to just relax, to play, to pursue a hobby, to do something that brings us joy, even if it's partying, you know? to do a hammock meditation, just lie in the hammock or go in nature, go hiking, cycling. So whatever you do, the others are always there. And only being aware of this will change the way you look at work, will change the way you look at practice, at mindfulness, at study. I always thought in the monastery or study, then I have to sit at the desk and look at these old texts that they are so boring, like the Bible. But it's not like that. You don't have to study books. You can study life. You can study your mind. You can study the mind of the people in front of you. You can actually exchange views, insights, and learn. That's what study is. And working is actually putting this into practice. And that what you have learned, what you have looked into through your practice, or the joy you have and receive from playing, you put into your work. And then work is not something you say, nah. From nine to five, okay, but then I won't want to stop. It's something that is changing just the cycle of a tangerine. Mind fulfillment. Yeah, you talked about being more present, uh, feeling more. 
I I want to I want to repeat a quote that I read last night. It is called. It, it goes like this: It is only with the heart that one can see rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eyes. It can only be felt. It cannot be seen. So something like this, where you are doing something, try to be more present. Do more or do it more with all the feelings that you have. And and with this, I I would also like to know. We all are working in a profit-driven industry. People call us capitalists. Yeah. Then how do you find a deeper meaning to your work? How can you connect it deeply and still feel fulfilled in this profit-driven profit-driven industry? So you think your work is meaningless? I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you didn't say that. That's what I conclude. That's what I conclude. Say it again. Say that again. Let me let me listen to that deeply. So we are working in a profit driven industry. How do I feel more fulfilled? How do I find a deeper meaning to it? Like I'm contributing to the world, yeah. making an impact. Well, again, I have to ask, you think it's, I don't think it's, a, it's, it's separate again, right? A profit driven mm -hmm. industry and being fulfilled are not two separate things. Just if you believe that that what you are doing doesn't make sense or is not good for you, then you might want to overthink what you are doing. Mm -hmm. But whatever you do, if you do it from a place of practice, of awareness, study, work, and play, you are there is this fulfillment because you are a whole being. And I worked also for a pharmaceutical company where at times I was asked from my friends, don't you feel bad about it? And sometimes I felt bad about it, other times not. Because I worked, it was a family-owned company and I worked together with the family and the board. So I had that context and the connection to the people who are driving this profit huh? or the force behind it. And I want to always explain to corporates who invite me that I'm not changing the corporate system and I'm not transforming company, but I'm touching people's hearts and they recognize themselves and they become mind fulfilled and they change the face of the company. And they are changing to more fulfilled, connected beings within. And because there is no difference without two, more happy people, content people, people with clarity, solidity, being master and having this inner tiger attained, you know, being master of the emotions, having clarity, being able to communicate good and bad in skillful ways. This is also driving profit, but it's beautiful. And makes, even if you believe your, your company is not contributing to the well-being of the planet or so, but the people in your company can contribute to the well-being of the planet by radiating, you know, being present. That's that's just beautiful, like, and 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 being there for yourself and for others, being a sentient human being, awake. Yeah, it's it's a perspective, I believe. Yeah. How do you see it? Because somebody might call you a capitalist, but in a way, you are making an impact to this entire world. We are the part of the value chain of the entire capital markets. And this is how we how we deliver value to the people and make this world connected again. Uh, going back to this, we are a very young bunch of crowd, crowd here. I would also like to uh, ask a question on behalf of people who are getting a bit older, going into the direction of midlife crisis. <laughs> you believe the so-called midlife crisis is actually a call from our inner voice to seek freedom and fulfillment. By the way, I wanted to give you a disclaimer before. At the end of this conversation, I don't want us to resign and shave our head and go to the monastery. <laughs> we will get the tools from Misha that we can use in our day-to-day -day life and be up to our optimal capacity in the service of others. You see, this question, I love this question, but I don't see anyone who could possibly near the midlife crisis except of myself. <laughs> and I don't definitely have 
And I definitely, but maybe to prepare you, right? And maybe to prevent it or to transform it or to transcend the notion of a midlife crisis, because I don't think it has anything to do with the inner voice, although it could be like understood as a wake up call for a change of direction or of questioning everything what I have done. And I always remember with and associate with midlife crisis, like men in their midlife crisis, they buy a red Porsche and women, what do they do? We don't know yet, right? They, they try to fill something in for something where they feel there's a gap. To me, a midlife crisis, what, what, what does it mean? You're exhausted. I think you're burned out because you ran all your life after a goal that you have reached only half, but you already run out, run out of air and of energy because you were just not mindful and aware enough of what are you doing and where have you been? We're always running into the future. You know, in Southeast Asia, now I have an image, these stairs to these temples, like in Kung Fu Panda, like a thousand stairs going up, steps up to that huge temple. And this is the goal where you want to be like happiness or your own house and family or two Maseratis or that's that goal what you set to yourself. And you start running full of energy. You want to get there. But you underestimate the length and the height and the obstacles and your own gravity, you know, and, and things that come your way. And halfway through, you say, oh, my God, what am I doing? Like myself, like I'm running my own bankruptcy. I, I want to leave everything behind. I think we're just exhausted by then from by our own pace, by our own like ambition and by our own expectations for us that we are that we are burning ourselves out and then we're thinking it's a call from from within that I did something wrong. No, you did you did actually something wrong from the very beginning. And the point is Try it if you walk stairs somewhere. I know you have an elevator, but there must be some stairs. That you walk stairs in a way that you could walk them with the same more or less breathing rhythm for three floors, for example. You know, that everybody knows that after the second floor, your heart starts beating faster. Walk in a way, you know, when you walk out of this room, walk in a way that you could walk forever. And don't limit yourself like. I want to go to the office, to the canteen, to the restroom. It's like the you are in a cycle. You will always walk. You will always breathe. You will always take stairs. You will always work. Work in a way. When you work, walk. You know, when you eat, eat. With your presence. You can still talk. I can still write a little note. But my awareness is there. And I think this is midlife crisis a little bit overestimated because people just don't see that they were running all the time. And they're just tired now, and it's time to rest and not buy a Porsche. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can still buy. <laughs> yeah, giving you are giving an example of a car. I also feel like our lives doesn't matter in what stage we are. Uh, it's built up of pillars. So there are like five important pillars, which I think are very important to everyone. First is their social life. Second could be their relationship. Third is their family. Fourth is their work, where they spend eight hours. And last is their health or spirituality, whatever. And if all of the five pillars of yourself are working fine, you have a good family connection, you have a good connection with your spouse, you have a good friend circle, you have a job that may lets you make money and live a good life, and you have good health, you are driving on my back. So it doesn't matter what kind of road do you drive on, doesn't matter how rough the road is, the journey will be nice. You will enjoy it because you are in a Maiba. But if there are four pillars which are working well, maybe you don't have a job, but you have all the four pillars working really well. It's like driving a BMW or an Audi. Yeah? You, you can go fast, but still you will feel the road. And on an average, every human being has at least three of the pillars really working right. Could be their work, could be their social life, and could be a love life, could be anything. And if you have those three pillars working right, it's like driving a Volkswagen. Yeah. <laughs> you, it is still doable, everything will be all right, but you will feel the road, you will feel where you go. And if you have at least two pillars working all right, it's like driving a bicycle. 
So <laughs> when you go on the road, you will feel all the surface and the journey may not be very smooth. So it is very essential for all of us to, to acknowledge when you have all the five pillars working well, that it might be temporary. It might not go like that forever. And this is how I also connect with your example, I guess. With That's the midlife good. crisis, it doesn't matter how young you are or how old you are, if you have the pillars balanced right, yeah. you can live a very fulfilling life. That's a beautiful example. And what about if you have one pillar, you are crawling? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like the bicycle one because if you have only two or five, right, and these are very pragmatic uh, pillars, then not only you feel every bump, but you're exposed to the weather. You, you don't have a roof on the top anymore, and you're much more in danger of, mm -hmm. um, of being hit, right? Mm -hmm. It's much more. Although I think they're always fluctuating, of course, yeah. in our lives as we yeah. go through our ups and downs. And who prevents us from having all five for right? Who prevents us being in harmony with our social life, with our spouse, with our family, with work, or with our own health or our spiritual needs? Only us who can empower ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. To to build on that pillar or to be aware of that pillar and to see if this pillar is lacking something. Mm -hmm. Like with these four elements, I said. With a, with a practice, study, work, and play, I believe every pillar is also present in the other pillar, okay. right? And if you listen deeply into yourself and you check and observe this, this transforming, ever-changing life in you, you will sense how many pillars are there to how many, on a scale from one to 10, you know, pillar number one is there with an eight, pillar number two, maybe two, but it's going up or you see tendencies. And this is also what life's, what life's about, right? To touch it and to feel it and to feel the friction. And, and but to be, to have, the, to have the feeling that it's in your hands. And also to take the responsibility that it is in my hand. Not always, but when it is, let me, let me put it into my hand. But also this conversation leads towards your understanding about what are the things that are in your control and what are the things that aren't in your control. Because if you chase the things that aren't in your control, you will be always burned out because things are not going your way. And I believe it is very important for a person to really find the boundary line where it ends that they have the control. And it's always fluctuating, right? It's supposed to be like that. Like with a tangerine, if you want the tangerine to be sweet, but you go there, you know, too early, it won't be sweet. Yeah. And then you're dissatisfied because it's sour. Then this is not in your control. It takes conditions, it takes more sun, more rain. It takes time for it to evolve. Maybe our impatience often is in our way that we, we have learned to, to get things by a click and have lost touch with that organic evolution. Evolve 2024 gives you a whole year to evolve, you know, and maybe even more. It's not just like we have one session and now please everybody's mindful and an awakened being and aware of your emotions and support each other and live like the hippies uh, back in the 60s. It's something that grows. And that expectation that we have to have things that we want or need now is limiting us. Yeah. Yeah. And there even more needs the support of others. You know, sometimes I can get lost, but then if I have somebody who also practices, works, studies, plays, can remind me or remind me just by being without even telling me something. St. Francis I told you that I come from a Franciscan uh, family. He said, Wherever you go, preach the Gospels, and if necessary, use words. So he wanted to live in a way that he lives like the teachings of Jesus. He lives that teaching of liberation, of becoming human. And I think the Buddha or all the spiritual teachers are trying to express the same. To live it, not to speak about it. Doing is like thinking, but much cooler. Yeah, and in this fast-paced environment, 
how do you think a person can stay focused? Because while I'm at my desk, I feel like there are tens and tens of emails flying around, so many messages, like colleagues, they are just stopping by my desk. We are talking things. I lose track of so many things. So how could you be more mindful and be focused there? Do you have a strategy? I'm curious to hear. Because I don't receive as many emails probably as you do. We do, yeah. 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 So how do, how do you cope with that? I can imagine getting 100 emails a day. For example, I would go mad. You had to go through all of them. Doesn't matter if you go home late, but you had to serve everyone, like all the requests, as many as possible. And it's difficult to be focused all the time because you might be working on thing A and then thing B came up, thing C came up, and at five o'clock you you just see thing A again and then you realize oh, this is spending. So how could we how could you be more focused? Yeah. What kind of strategies did you use while you were at the monastery? But also there I didn't receive any emails. <laughs> but you see, this doesn't sound to me only fast paced, but also overwhelming. It's fast paced because it needs your instant response probably. But also it's so overwhelming much and you have to open and read every single one, not slip through something. Therefore, even more, you have to be very present. If you are you know, tired or overwhelmed or burned out or near exhausted, you're not doing yourself good and you're not doing that email or, or that action, that work that you're doing well. And I think we can come back to that place of the four elements, the bringing awareness in while you are working with a mind, with a curious and exploring mind, and some space for fun, making a joke about a hundred emails and that you have to look at them, you know, being a little bit ironical, cynical, you still have to go through them, but you will do it with another spirit. It might take you a few minutes longer, but at the end of the day, you will not be exhausted. So you save maybe even a little bit more time taking care of you again and going to the gym because you don't need it when you are doing things mindfully, taking five minutes longer in total, but you don't need to, I don't know, sleep for half an hour on the couch and, and just relax or, or do a meditation to calm your mind down. If you already do it with a calm mind, I know this is a lot of emails. I know I have to go through every, I know I have to be done by 10. Then, then it can help. I was often late as a, as a coming, said I have a Croatian background in the Mediterranean and being in a monastery, Zen, and be on time. So when I came late, not much. And I'm saying this because you have to finish, this is the deadline, you know? And then, they say, Brother Freedom, you're late. I said, I know I'm late, but I'm happy. <laughs> and they also laughed because they also valued that I'm not here now for the meeting, for whatever, but I'm completely stressed and out of breath and not here with my mind. I'm late, but I'm happy, I'm present, and let's rock and roll. No, now we can now we can go. And even if you, of course, there are deadlines you have to hit. But to me, it is more your attitude towards it. How do I approach it? This is, this is the cycle. No, this is the ever-changing being you are. And, and the observer and the gardener, the gardener of your own tangerine tree, basically, at the same time. So how do I approach it? And as students, we know sometimes we can take it easy. And two days before the test, you know, we work 48 hours and drink coffee all the time and don't eat. We can do that too, and you can do that. You know? But I don't have the experience to concretely answer that question. That's that's how I would do it. Yeah, thank you. Very and much. How are you doing? I will not reveal it. <laughs> <laughs> next time. Next not time. Not we'll <laughs> <laughs> so we are almost running short of time. I would like to give some space to the audience if they have any questions. Um, anyone, please. Questions? Let them think. <laughs> um, I once heard that uh, burnout can only have two core workers. 
burnout. Burn a burnout would only happen to people who burn so people who are higher with the topic. This is this is um, basically the initial point where where that 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 is the only way a burnout can happen that you are on fire. For example. Because I, this was something I heard many many years ago from a friend of mine. So say working environment, a very stressful day, um, and. For me, I first thought, okay, it makes sense. But uh, after a while, I thought, okay, we're all kind of on fire. Like, it's just not stopping at the point where it becomes too extreme, right? And then it needs to burn out, not, not seeing where to stop and not being um, satisfied and pleased with what, what you have, but always striving for more. It's a beautiful image. I like that image because it gives you so, it gives you an yeah, image, picture. right? Yeah. yeah. I love it, and I agree with you. Did everybody? Not everybody heard you. I heard. I hardly heard you. So burning out only happens to people who are on fire. Who, who are on fire before? Yeah. Then before you can only before, so you yeah. can actually burn out. You That's to burn to burn out. And and then what, what did you say? you said something else about the fire? You have, but everybody has a sort of fire we at are right, all on fire. right? Our it's aspiration, like like exactly. Family, work, I don't know, sports. That's whatever. our fire, right? Yeah. Yes, it's just not stopping at the point where we can satisfy for it, exactly. not not uh, being aware of, also being pleased with what we uh, have, but uh, always striving for more. Always striving for more. The fire becomes so hot or neglected, mm -hmm. or we are so busy doing other things that we leave the fire burn by itself and it gets out of control and then burns out. A lot of a lot of things you can play with that image. What came to me when I heard you speaking is that also if you don't nourish the fire, if you don't put locks on it again and again and keep it burning in a size you want to have it, like with the people, and now I'm thinking of a bonfire, people around with the guitar and coming back to the hippies, you know, but not making it too big or let it dying out, burn out. This plays a part too. So are you with are you with your fire? You know? And that brings me back to the stairs of the temple. Are you just running after something like that stubborn donkey that doesn't want to walk? So they put a stick with a carrot in front of his head and he walks after this carrot just to 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 eat it and we will get the carrot but maybe if we cannot enjoy it and right? so to nourish to nourish your fire your drive and to also tame it not let it like burn the whole not make it a wildfire but also not let it burn out and maybe not tend it by yourself there are so many beautiful now little images and stories i i can add to that like a fireplace, you know, and the family sitting before, and then somebody, the little one, say, I want to get dead. Can I put a little log? And sometimes somebody else puts a little log on it. You want to keep it a certain size, but you are there. And then we have presence of mind again, presence, and care, and connection. And actually, there you can feel it. Right? You feel the warmth. Right? We are all, we are all a fire. Lovely. I don't know if this was a question. Now I learned something. No. Now I studied something. Yeah, it was just what you think about because she, um, her association with uh, burning was that it leads to burnout. But and I thought at the beginning it makes sense. But uh, in the meantime, I thought, okay, this is so negative, and for me, uh, burning is something positive. And also, what Manish said that there are kind of five streams in your life, um, and I think having one or two or even more streams in your life, if you don't have the capacity right now to take care of your fire, um, then maybe one of the streams can take for, can take uh, care for you for a certain amount of time. So I think it's all the balance. Well, there's a lot of variety around this image and maybe this was the way she felt Yeah. and she expressed it to you. She, for her, it felt like she was so much on fire and all the time and, uh, and now it's over. And then if you're still in touch with her, if it's a friend or so, then you can just add on and build on, yeah. on that image and say, yeah. if you see it from this perspective. Because, you know, also with, with hearing or, or, or talking or seeing things or seeing the world or looking at the meaning of life, it's always in perspective. Everything you hear 
It's like an opinion, but not the fact. And everything you see is like your perspective. We don't see life as it is. We see life as we are with all our upbringing. So I said, we are not four years old and running around here undressed, the Deutsche Börse. You know, we are not free to do what we want to do. And even if you look at a jar of sugar and of salt, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference, you know, and take the sugar and then you take the sugar. We don't know. 99% spiritual people, like also my teacher says, of our perceptions are wrong. So it's more about sharing and, and exchanging and communicating and sharing perspectives so that you can learn and that you can get deep into the topic, right? Touch one thing deeply and everything is there. Beautiful image, thank you. One more question from Louisa. Yeah, um, Manish mentioned in the beginning that you're also working with big corporations like Meta or Google. What is it that you typically do with the teams? Is it like today, like fireside chat or keynote speech, or is it really like one two day workshops that you're offering for the teams? Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, I'm not working for Meta. That was in my time in the US, but it's beautiful. And I think these chats or a little talk is necessary to bring spark the fire. And I see some, I, I, I sparked some little fires and I hope you don't burn out. Take good care of the fires or you don't burn out. Spark the fire of uh, mindfulness. But really what is it is about to do it, to put it into it. You know, as I said, like thinking is nice, but action is rock and roll. So if we can... And I offer workshops for teams, for example, we do mindful office, you know, and there we and there we tackle communication. There we, we will see how do we handle things, how we communicate, how we answer the phone, how we write a positive email, how we write a negative email, with being respectful and not losing our energy, how we don't get drowned into emotions, into the connections with our team, how we stay focused. And how we can do it with simple actions like washing our hands, opening doors, turning on a light switch. Now, how do I walk through the office? And what can I contribute to the harmony of the office by my style of walking? You know, without even trying to work artificially, but rather more relaxed. How can I train myself to be late five minutes to the meeting, but happy? You know? And having the others laugh, laugh at me too. And this is this is, I think, why I'm here. I really would love anywhere to, to do it. I don't want to see it or talk about it. I want to do it. And if I can spark that in, in people, I say, oh, this, sound, this is why I left society. Because I said, I'm here are the answers of my questions when I read this book of the Zen Master. And I said, here are the, it was actually a mirror. There were no letters in it. I saw myself as a five-year-old, as I said, like, this is what I want to do. And so it was easy to make the decision to go to the monastery, although it's not a general strategy, you know, and not for everyone. But it was the right thing for me. And I think if we can feel that, you know, to get in touch with like these fruits of mindfulness, of being alive in this moment and to nurture it like a fire that warms us. And like if you go with a fire and a steam engine, right, that makes us go ahead and make things work and function. But it's controlled in a in a in a steam tank. So there's so many images we can do that. Then, and you feel I want to do it, and that would be this is my reward when I see already some smiles and you recognize it in you, you know, you. And then, I my heart is like just smiling. Thank you. <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> are we running out of time or not? Sure, we can ask one. Um, so basically, I mean, we started the whole session with the point we were all kind of looking for something or we're missing something. Um, and I was wondering when in your journey did you have the feeling that you actually found something? And is it like, is it really a moment or is it more of progress? And also, do you still today feel sometimes more and, and less fulfilled? Of course, well, I'm not like Jesus or the Buddha. And I don't want to be also. Many come to the monastery, they think they will become enlightened, you know, and they're working hard. And the harder they work, the more terrible people they are. 
And there is a joke in the monastery, when you think you're enlightened, go and visit your parents for a week. <laughs> they, will, they will show you where you are. They know all your buttons. No, of course. But I don't think it's about finding yourself because you are it. You know, it's more about the realization like that we are in that change, in that ever-changing world, and that we are not separate from a tangerine, that we are not separate from that. So it's not like a button from your winter coat that you can lose and then you find it again and put it on. But I have good days and bad days, and I'm, as I said, I'm glad about it. I have this mensch and the mönch, so I have the tools of the mönch to suffer in the meantime, which I didn't have before, but I'm still the mensch who wants to experience all of that, who wants to go through summer and winter and not press the pause button in summer, although I really would love to. But living in California, I was actually missing, you know, some uh, Indian summer and these are golden in October and stuff. And the winds, the chilly winds, just the snow can stay in me. But, <laughs> but it's like to suffer and to be happy to experience all. And to be in touch with you and to know what you need now and to have a variety of, let's call it strategies, tools that you can fulfill yourself, the mind, your needs, and nourish the fire that is burning in you. you. At this, we are coming to an end. Oh, one more. There is a gentleman. Oh, wow. It's so so rare all, that... uh, thanks, uh, thanks for this great uh, hour together with you. I have a more practical question. Um, so um, it was really unique experience to have this fruit or to eat this fruit together. And I was asking myself um, as a monk, if you also have um, times um, where you are starving for, for a longer period, and if this also contributes to your happiness, and if this is something what you would also recommend for more people to do. Or did you like the tantric meditation? You said they like it. It was, was really unique. So for oh. me, it was great also to have it uh, uh, in, in such an uh, environment. It was uh, absolutely unique for me. So thank you very much for that. Okay. Um, to your question. And perhaps not only starving from food, also starving from other stuff, for, from people, yeah. television, media, everything. Yeah. It's like fasting. Exactly. exactly. Fast. And yes, of course, and I think it is helpful. And just to stay flexible and not fall into habits that become that will become that will rule you basically, right? In Buddhism, there is an image for habits. It's a it's a running horse through the desert with a rider on it. So there's a man standing in the desert and he has a galloping and he sees like a, a dust, out of dust in, in, in the distance. And it comes close and close. It's a man riding on a horse. And they're galloping fastly, passing him by, and he just is able to shout like, hey, where are you? Where are you going? And the rider turns back and says, I don't know, ask the horse. And that's often how we, if we do things all over again, we don't even think anymore. We're not even able to think what we are doing. So fasting or having a break or changing things can help us very much staying alive, staying alert, staying mindful, and, and being here and checking, am I sure, I mean, is it making me happy? You know, is my full attention, where's my attention? Am I with me? Am I connected? So I think it is helpful. I have created or generated some habits or rituals. You know, the opposite of a, of a routine is a ritual when you do it with awareness. I'm not eating dinner because I get up I go to bed very early, like 9.30, 10, and I want to wake up at 4.35 because this is so beautiful in the morning. And I want to wake up lightly, so I don't usually eat dinner. And it's hard at the beginning, and you go slowly if you want to do that, or you eat just lightly, a soup. And then after a while, your body gets used to it. Like fasting, I say from 9 o'clock, 9, 9 p.m., no screen time anymore. I'm just interested. In the morning, my first two hours, I don't want to see a screen. I get this. I have my watch on because it's sleeping my track. I see this red, red dot. I know there are notifications. But I need, you know, even 
thing in the morning, this first hour I wake up, even I, said, I, I wouldn't stand it, like to see whatever it is, you know, good or bad, I don't want to know it. I, I want to be here. This is nourishing me. So, yes, but it's the same with the fire. Moderation and balance is the key, you know? Mind and body connected, what you need, what your body needs, what your mind needs, what needs to be done. Uh, but with attention, with purposeful attention, where you can ask yourself just one more minute, right? Because you're touching something beautiful. When we say we pay attention, right? So what are you paying attention to? What benefit does it have? In German, we say we are schenken Aufmerksamkeit. In both cases, we're giving something away. Paying attention even means something that I earned with my hard work. Now I'm giving it away. Now, when you pay for any for any material good, you are checking it before, right? Is it worth it? Will it make me happy? Do I need it? What will it do with me? What are the consequences? What material is it? Now, when we're paying attention, just remember your attention, what you're paying attention to during the day. Are you going through these questions? So what we have to ask ourselves is, am I sure what I'm paying here? Your attention is like a currency. And your harmony, your connection, your aliveness is the price you pay. You, are you willing to give it away so wastefully without asking yourself, will I feel better? Will I feel more free? Will it liberate me? Will it make me help evolve, grow, be a fulfilled person, to, to use the terms we were touching? And this doesn't take much. This can be a beautiful reminder to, during the day to bring you back to the present moment. What am I doing? Is it a routine? Is it a ritual? Uh, am I depriving myself from something? How does it feel? Is it good? No? Do I actually need it? And I need TV, I need sleep, I need dinner, then do it. But check in the moment what is needed. The good thing is, in a world that is ever changing, you can never be wrong because it's changing all the time and you just like, like driving a car and going on, on the accelerator pedal and braking, you know, it's up to you. You see there is a turn, so I, I better don't accelerate here. You go a little bit slower. After the turn, you want to go faster. Again. And that's how you live your life, your body-mind balance, your emotional balance. And with mindfulness, you are in touch with these things. With mindfulness, if you go deeper and you practice these little things, your day-to-day -day actions, you get a feel for it. And then when bigger things come into your life, you already are used to doing the smaller things. It's like going to the gym, starting with a 10 kilo bar and then you're going to a 50 kilo bar. So you're training yourself to basically tackle life. You know? Yeah. Awesome. Well, we could talk forever. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean... Now let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was very nice to have you. Uh, hopefully, everyone who joined us online, who joined us in person, learned a lot today. Uh, it was very nice to have you. Thank you for taking the time to come to us to share the words of wisdom with us. I hope everyone enjoyed. And yeah, and then thank you. Thank you all.